Our text this morning is uh, Mark chapter 9, starting with verse 33. And um, today we're going to continue our journey. And um, the Lord has a lesson for all of us to observe and to also apply to our own lives on uh, humility and servanthood. So in preparation for this, you can imagine how um, Morgan was joking this morning in the prayer room. He's like, oh, you're preaching on humility? Ha, ha, ha. I know what that's like in preparation. Because <laughs> God always gives you a taste, right, of what you need to express to the people, which is, which is great. Um, so would you bow with me in prayer before we start today? Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your word, your precious word. Lord, help us to understand what your Spirit says to us today. May our hearts be wide open, God. Anything that's in the way, God, that's uh, keeping what you want to hear or want us to hear, God, just unstop our ears, Lord, today. Help us to observe what you're saying, and, and uh, we praise you and we thank you for this chapter in Mark and, and the teaching, Jesus, that you gave to your disciples. And we pray that we'd, we'd just be able to apply everything. In Jesus' name, Amen. So the setting was that, um, you know, we just finished last week talking about how the disciples were having a hard time with this little boy who had uh, a demon and um, how they were unable to see this demon come out of the boy. And there was some frustration around that and Jesus uh, taught about that. So they just finished dealing with this and they were, they were traveling along the roadway um, and they were going back to Capernaum, the hometown of Peter, James, and John. And um, as they were traveling along, um, the scriptures say, seem to indicate that these disciples found themselves uh, arguing amongst themselves about something. Um, they were arguing, and Jesus uh, confronts this. They were arguing about who was going to be the greatest among them. So, starting with verse 33, they came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. So, when Jesus asked this question, once they were probably in one of the disciples' homes there, uh, and they were reclining and resting from their journey, Jesus brings us up. And instinctively, the disciples knew that they had done wrong. They wouldn't answer Jesus because their consciences were ashamed. And it appears that the teachings of Jesus, in that sense, were starting to sink in, which is good because... Um, they had a lot of things to iron out. And when he asked them about what they were talking about, they realized, they realized that their pride had gotten the best of them. And actually, the shame that they were feeling was, was a very healthy sense of shame. You know, the disciples, you can imagine them there, and Jesus picks this out, and they're like, oh, yeah, I guess... We got a lot to go, a lot of places to go yet here and growing. I don't know about you, but sometimes things happen in my life where I'm amazed at how little I know and how much I need to know. It shouldn't shock us. It's part of the human condition. Um, you see, this the disciples pre before the cross they didn't totally see the big picture yet, right? Jesus was trying to explain it to them, but they were very slow in learning. Sometimes we can be slow in learning. Um, the disciples, in this case, they, they, they still had come to follow Jesus with some lofty ideas about Jesus and his, his kingdom and, and how they were going to, he was the Messiah, and they were going to take over the world, and he was going to be the king Messiah in the physical realm. And, and of, course, of course, their thoughts we're gravitating towards, well, we're going to be a part of it. 
We're going to be a part of this great kingdom that's coming in, and Jesus all of a sudden is just going to go boom, and we're at the forefront. We're going to be, we're going to be getting pretty uh, cool positions out of this deal. Like God's, we're special. God's chosen us to, to, to hear about his, his plans, and he's going, when the plans unfold, we're going to be great. They just finished dealing with this already. They need to learn it all over again, right? See, so Jesus, patient as he is, he brought this out on purpose, right? He brought this out on purpose, and he shifts gears and, and becomes the rabbi. He becomes the teacher. So he sat down, it says here, and he called his disciples to where he was sitting to explain something really important for all people who want to be disciples of Jesus Christ to understand. It goes beyond the apostles, and the Lord has it here in his word to show us the human heart and some things that we need to, to know. Third, verse 35 says, Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. So Jesus told them that in fact, they're arguing about who's the greatest, right? The way to be first in his kingdom was not to pursue power and control over other people. That's the established patterns of the kingdoms of this world. And the Bible says very clearly that we're not to have the pattern of this world. We're not to follow the patterns of this world because the patterns of this world are different than the patterns of Christ. They're diametrically opposed, actually. The patterns of this world are diametrically opposed to the patterns that Jesus lays down. Verse 35. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you must learn to be the servant of all. No servant. When you, I mean, we don't have a very huge picture in our head like maybe some other cultures in the past where servants were part of everyday living, right? So we have to kind of think about it. What are the characteristics of a servant? Well, when you think about a servant, right? A servant attends to his responsibilities with the understanding that he or she is not the center of attention. You are not the object of attention. A servant doesn't see himself or herself as being one to be adored, or attended to uh, with every waking moment. A servant willingly gives of himself or herself in order to see others flourishing at the sacrifice of their own self-interest. The words of servant and leader, when you look at the system of this world, are often um, portrayed as polar opposites, and deliberately bringing these, wor wor these words together, servant, leader, Jesus had handpicked these 12 to be his apostles, so he's calling them to leadership, but he's also calling them to servanthood, so he's combining leader and servant together. In a meaningful way, Jesus lays the groundwork for what God desires true leadership in the church to look like. The greatness of a true Christian leader is his or her ability to approach the power of leadership lightly. And that goes for leadership in the home. You know, you got the autocratic style. You will listen to me because I'm the boss. I'm the one that has the authority. You got that kind of style. And that, that, we've seen that, we see that kind of style in politics, right? We see that kind of style in homes, uh, you know. Why, why is my family falling apart, you know? Well, look at your leadership. What are you doing? Leader, true godly leadership is relational. The greatness of a true Christian leader or, or someone who's, who's, who's living for Christ, not just 
a leader, but anyone that's living for Christ, is to approach people as though they are precious, and they are. Every person is precious to God. So Jesus launches into an illustration, an active illustration to to show what he's trying to get across to his disciples. So what does he do? Verse 36. He take he took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, "Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me." See, this isn't just talking about treating children nicely which is important. What this is talking about is how God wants his children, his children, to operate as believers when they're in the church. The mark of a true Christian leader on every level is concerned with ministering to and caring to caring for and protecting people who are vulnerable without any thoughts about what they can offer or what can be gained from building a relationship with them. The world says that if you're great, you're going to have others working for you and bolstering your profile. But Jesus says that greatness comes from serving others and putting others' interests above our own with humility. Warren Wearsby, the former pastor of the Calvary Baptist Church in Covington, Kentucky, he said this once, and I quote, if we have the heart of a child, we will have little difficulty being servants. We will welcome the children as representatives of Jesus Christ and the Father. That rings true. You see, not only does God want us to treat vulnerable people and children with, with caring and, and, and nurturing. Vulnerable people get taken under wing in the true church. Not only does God want that displayed, but he also wants his servants to have a soft heart like that of a young child towards him and towards others. See, this is what Jesus had in mind when he's teaching about caring for those who are vulnerable like children. Becoming a little child in the way that we approach him and others. Experiencing the life of God in this life requires humility like that of a little child who hasn't been poisoned by experiences of hurt and, and horror in this world. So what, in what way? In what way are we to be child like in our, in our approach to God and others. Okay. Well, it's not by being ignorant. It's not by being, um, not studying, not, not being wise. You know, there's foolishness bound up in the heart of a child. It's not talking about that foolishness that's bound up in the heart of the child. No. Um, it's so that we might learn, grow, mature, reason, and become students and disciples of Jesus Christ and grow up into maturity. God calls us to that spiritually, to be mature, to be adults in maturity, but children in the way that we deal with other people and how we treat them. I think there's something in the scriptures called the fruit of the Spirit. You want to know who's great in the kingdom of God? Check out the fruit. The fruit of the Spirit shows greatness because it's not self-focused. It's other-centered. Jesus, being the Lamb of God, he gave himself. When he's the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, the most powerful figurehead in the whole universe, he created everything by the word of his mouth, and he's the one that's humbling himself and giving himself. That's our example. So, 
having that heart isn't about being ignorant and not taking study seriously and just all fun and games and not going deep. That's not what he's talking about here. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul tells Timothy, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So we don't abandon our, our serious study of God's word and his character and the, and, the, and, the, and the doctrines of scripture. We don't abandon that. We dig deep into that. But approaching God and others in a childlike manner means we approach with without complicated expectations. Tenderness of conscience, openness about emotions and feelings, creativity and imagination, wonder and awe, joy, eternal hope, and yes, even some playfulness and humor, right? Trust, easy forgiveness, undying love, boundless exuberance and energy to do God's work and to impact others. Always thinking about the best about life and other people. Being, being willing to, to learn and to grow. That, that's, these are the qualities we're talking about. That Those qualities define little children. As the children get older, they get more hardened right, by the things that hurt them. Well, God wants to take your hurts. If you're hurt and you're finding yourself to be the cave troll of your house, <laughs> hey, can you identify? Oh, I, I can. <laughs> There's been times when I've been pretty miserable, right? It's time for us to bow the knee of our heart and say, soften me up, Lord. Return me to my first love. Let love reign inside. May my heart be pure. Jesus is looking for disciples who care for seemingly insignificant people like little children because, in fact, seemingly insignificant people are actually of great significance to God because God saw me and he saw you seemingly insignificant and he's placed great significance on you because he loves you and he offers you a place in his kingdom and he even allows you to become part of his kingdom work. What a beautiful thing. What a glorious calling that we have. Who are we to compare and place value on people due to their outward stature or status? Jesus wants us to have the same care and concern that he has for every single person, including you and me, and to take this lesson to heart. James speaks to the heart of this very issue in his epistle, and this is a good illustration of the teachings of the apostles once they begin to understand this. James chapter 2, 1 to 4 says, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes to your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, here, sit on the floor by my feet. You stand there. I got that mixed up. You stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated upon, among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? In God's eyes, every man, woman, or child in this planet, no matter what they look like, no matter their hang-ups, no matter their disabilities, no matter their talents or, or abilities, they're seemingly insignificant in relation to God's glory, the power of the Lord and the glory of his majesty makes all of us look insignificant. Yet, he loves us. He knows us by name. He knows you by name. He knows everything about your life. And he calls you like that little child that Jesus took and sat on his lap and held. That's how he treats us. You might not feel like a child, but God wants to restore in you the innocence. If you haven't given your heart to Jesus Christ, I'm telling you right now, 
There is salvation in Jesus' name by the power of the blood of Jesus. If you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he'll cast your sin as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. And that is very good news because God can take a heart that is broken by sin and evil and can restore and bring new life within. This is the gospel. You can accept Jesus today. Accept him as your Savior. Romans 2.11, Paul writes, for God does not show favoritism. So the, the disciples were encouraged to welcome the little ones in the name of Jesus because in welcoming the, the little ones, that was akin to welcoming Jesus himself. Moreover, to welcome them is to welcome the Father God who sent his son Jesus to be the redeemer of mankind. When we love our neighbor and welcome the little ones, we love God. As a disciple, Jesus says, if you want to be great in the kingdom, you must learn to be the servant of all. So going further into what Jesus was trying to teach, it was confession time. So I'm sure the disciples were going, oh man, oh yeah, I see, we see, Lord. It was confession time. So since Jesus was telling the 12 that to be truly great in God's eyes, they had to become the servants of others, not to strive to become the big kahuna. John confesses something. He's, he confesses that he and the other disciples had done something further that showed their ambitions for ministry success were missing the mark. So we read in verse 38, Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Hmm. So confession time. John's confessing on behalf of the other 11 that they were doing this, that they had done this. In their hearts, the disciples were looking at the thing, the stage being set, and, and they wanted to be big kahunas. They wanted to be at the top of the stack. And they wanted the ministry of casting out demons and devils listening to what they were saying to be exclusive ministry of the 12 or maybe a few exclusive other people that Jesus kind of set apart. Well, if you remember, in Mark 9, 14, what we dealt with last week, the disciples of Jesus had just seen failure in seeing the demon cast out of a little boy. And here, another believer in Jesus who was not one of the 12 was seeing success at exorcism. But the disciples told him to stop because he was not one of them. What did Jesus say? He says, do not stop him, Jesus said. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Now, I, you can imagine, right? You ha it had to frustrate Jesus' disciples on a human level that these peripheral followers of Jesus had successfully cast out these demons when they had just failed? I mean, humanly speaking, they, they felt this way. And the disciples seemed to have reason that because this person was not one of the 12 or not attached to their entourage, that he should not be doing miracles in the name of Jesus. That privilege belongs to us. <laughs> See the pride? Human. It's, it's natural. Human nature. Pride. They were the ones um, who Jesus empowered to do supernatural wonders. This other person's ministry actually threatened their status and their potential role as the big kahunas in the, in the kingdom. And the man casting out demons in Jesus' name did not follow, follow us, what John said. The emphasis is on us, not on the glory of God. What's truly baffling is that Jesus had just finished showing them that performing miracles was not possible if they tried in their own strength to accomplish them themselves. They were not a cast of specially gifted human beings in a special class of their own. Sometimes people wear spiritual gifts as a badge of honor. They're not a badge of honor. They are a mark of the presence of the Holy Spirit and they come with humility 
and understanding that it is the Lord that does this good thing. It is not myself that does it. I don't possess what it is that I'm doing. That's witchcraft, people. Where you try to manipulate the spiritual world based on my gift. My, 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 my. No. No. In the scriptures, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. And if God gives you a gift, it's for his glory. It all points to Jesus because Jesus is the center of it all. And God will not share his glory with another. You want to see false teaching? See people claiming gifts for their, for their own, for their, to bolster their own seat at the table, you might say, in the kingdom of God. They want to be the big kahuna. Beware. When you see that going on, there is all kinds of other things happening. Beware. This is why we must test the spirits. What's truly baffling is that Jesus had just finished dealing with this before they went to Capernaum. And on the road, it's just like what we were talking about before. You know, they had seen the loaves and fishes, miracle with the 5,000. And then by the time the 4,000 came around, they're still scrambling around, you know, like, the sea was rough and was, was calmed by the Lord one, in one occasion, and the next occasion, they were in this panic mode again when the, the next storm comes on. People, we are slow to learn. I'm pointing two, you know, f- ten fingers at, well, ten and a half, or nine and a half fingers at myself, <laughs> saying, you know, like, sometimes, despite knowing Christ and seeing the power of God at work, sometimes I can pretty, be pretty slow to learn. We all can, but the Holy Spirit can teach us through his word what is truth, and we can stand on the principles. Now, in my younger days, um, I had a bit of an issue. Um, It's good for us to remember that God's not solely in alignment with one particular group of of believers. Um, sometimes we're trained to believe that he is. In my younger days, I, I had a bit of an issue. See, I, I, I've been raised in the Pentecostal movement. That's where my parents got saved. And the, well, actually, they got saved in a Baptist church, but then they became part of this Pentecostal church, and they were part of the Pentecostal movement. And we saw the power of God in our family, res- like changing people. Like, there was definitely the power of God there, so... It was just part of what, and my wife, the, her family, you know, they, they were part of the Pentecostal movement as well. And, um, you know, being raised in the movement, I, I, I saw this Pentecostal pride. And, and myself, I, I had some of that. But throughout our adult lives, I, God saw f- fit to put my wife and I both on this journey where we came to learn something. Something that needed to be learned. And due to the circumstances we found ourselves in, we, we had the great privilege to attend other evangelical churches outside of the movement that we grew up in. And we saw God moving powerfully amongst other groups of believers, even though they did some things much differently than what we were used to. Because there was a culture in, in, in where, where we were raised. They did things a certain way. And we got used to that. But God was doing incredible things in other places in, with different methods and different service orders and different ways of doing things, but the same Holy Spirit was present in these places. You know, we attended and became part of several different churches in our adult lives. We were part of a Mennonite Brethren Church, an Associated Gospel Church. We were part of a Conference Baptist Church for a time and an independent interdenominational church. And we've seen how, how, how things were done differently. But we saw the saints of God living for Christ, and we saw the power of God manifest in the believers, even though things were done differently. Now, I'm not saying that everyone has everything right. There's things, I'm sure within every body of believers, within every organization, there's things to learn, right? Right? This is why Jesus speaks to the seven churches in, uh, in Revelation because there's different types of churches and each of those churches have strengths, but they also have weaknesses. When you look at the epistles to the different churches, 
in the Bible, you know, you got Ephesus, you got Colossians, you got Thessalonians, you got Corinthians. Each one of those churches had different strengths, but they also had different hang-ups and things to learn. The question was not whether they were part of the body of Christ. The question was, yes, they might be a different flavor. They might be a different flavor, but the center focus was still the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. As written in the Word, the Bible was the core uh, place where we turn to for guidance. And the Spirit of the Lord was alive in His people. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying we should abandon um, doctrinal positions. It's not, there's an emerging church that's coming out right now that's not healthy at all. Stay away from it. There, there's, there's people going so far as to say that Jesus Christ didn't really get raised from the dead. The resurrection isn't real. You see it on Facebook. You see it on the internet. There's different preachers in the states that are preaching it. It's all heresy. But I'm telling you this. There is a movement of Jesus Christ that is founded on the word of God that, has, that is derived from the living God in the Holy Spirit made possible by the blood of Christ through grace alone. And those believers are in different assemblies. We'd be best to lay down our pride and to work with them, not against them. Yeah, do I believe in the fundamentals of the movement that I'm in right now? Like I'm, I'm pastoring? Yes, I do. But, you know, being in, in some of these different assemblies that we we were in. There's some things that, yeah, there's one little area here of doctrine that maybe I don't see eye eye on. We agree to disagree, yet we submitted ourselves to the, uh, to the leadership team that was in that assembly, and we didn't push our ideas. We prayed. And I'm not saying we're perfect, because sometimes we weren't. <laughs> sometimes I put the old foot in the mouth, right? Sometimes I said some things that probably were out of turn. You know, if you got an, a difference of opinion on a doctrinal issue that's not a major, okay, I'm not talking about whether Jesus Christ is the Son of God, whether he's God in the flesh, that's major. I mean, you can't go to a Jehovah Witness church and be a believer. It's just not, the, the, they don't believe Jesus is God. That's a huge thing. That's, that's non-negotiable. <laughs> But, you know, there's churches that are preaching the word of God right now from their pulpits all over this town. And they're every bit as much believers as we are. And Jesus loves them. So, let's not get exclusive, right? We need to work together, like the 12, right? Well, they're not part of us. No, but they're part of me. That's what Jesus is saying. We do best to pray about this. So that we don't have this pride that causes us to think more highly of ourselves than we ought and to get this attitude of exclusivity. Yes, do we believe that there's strengths in our movement that the others could use? Absolutely there is. But there's also some things that we learned being in these other churches that we were weak in growing up. I could see it. The same Jesus. When I was in Israel... Interestingly, the Messianic churches in Israel, their service is completely different than what we do here. You went there and you had service and you're looking and the, all the people get up and would come up to the front during worship service. They join hands and they do the Jewish do -do 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 singing their songs, right? I didn't recognize any of the songs. They had on their overhead, they had songs in English, Russian. The, they were translated into English, Russian, and Hebrew. And all these people would get up and they'd be just do -do 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 -do. And, you know, they, they brought out the Old Testament Torah scroll and they put it like a synagogue, put it on the, on the, on the holder, and they read from the Old Testament, and the pastor tied in with the, the text from the Old Testament and with the New Testament. It was done differently. Same Holy Spirit was there. The Lord was active in those people. They called Jesus Yeshua. Their Messiah, Jesus Yeshua. And when they praise the Lord, and you hear that Yeshua, it just, oh, it's like exactly what we experienced here this morning. For worshiping God and turning our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Different culture. 
different way, different flavor, but still the same God. That's what I'm talking about. Now, there's, again, there's hills to die on. There's certain movements out there that you need to stay away from. So don't just swallow that. This, this new movement that's progressive Christian, they call it progressive Christianity, it's not so progressive. It's heresy. Stay away from it. Anyways. If we truly desire to be great in God's kingdom, both individually and, and as an assembly, these lessons that I, we brought to light this morning are so important for us to grasp. May the Lord give us the understanding of how we approach him and how we approach others. And rather than trying to strive to be the big kahunas, we must learn to serve one another in humility and love. Treating other people with the same heart that Jesus had when he dealt with the children. And despite all of the cold, hard things, we learn in the adult world, God wants us to have that soft, soft, childlike heart towards others and towards him. This isn't something we can just pull up our bootstraps on. and uh, That's an old saying. Young people, you don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Bootstraps. Okay, well... Okay, you ever see an old man with suspenders that keeps his pants from falling down? Yeah, well, you, if you pull your, pull your pants up and you hold them in place, yeah. Well, that's, uh, you know, there, there's, there's different cultural understandings. But we can't, we can't hold ourselves together, people. We can't make ourselves be the loving, caring people that God wants us to be. If this only comes as we bow the knee of our heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and we say, Jesus, I can't do this on my own. I need you, Lord. Would you take my life and do whatever you want with it? That's the only way. It's only by God's grace that you can be who he's called you to be. It's not through human effort. Yes, human effort in the, in the way of obedience, but not human effort in earning brownie points with God and 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 trying to be, you know, on your own. You, you can't. You won't do it. May the Lord help us to have hearts of humility in praying for other Christians who are not part of our favored movement or our own assembly. May we genuinely be glad when we see the kingdom of God advancing through other assemblies, just as we're glad when he advances his kingdom in ours. The Lord Jesus has a plan for his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ because the church of Jesus Christ is not an institution. It is the blood-bought saints of God who have been brought into the presence of the Most High God and who are, are his children because of what he has done. May our pride in what we can do and who we are be humbled and submitted to the Lordship of Christ so that our participation with God's mission here at Hillside, both as individuals and as a collective unit, would be God-glorifying and that we'd fulfill the mission here in 100 Mile. God's given us a mission, bringing glory to him, seeing people come to know the living Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord of all, and effectively being discipled and become becoming a servant just like Jesus. Amen.